Danny Harris is a former terrorist financing analyst at the Treasury Department. Uh, and he is now a storyteller and a folklorist. And his final session for the first half is called A Tour of DC in 20 Faces. I'm somebody who's always understood place through people. That's why I started People's District two years ago to better understand the texture and the soul of the city. Because you see, the city is defined by these people, people like Thomasine, who's lived her entire life in the district, working as an operator for the government where her voices travel to every single country around the world, but she's never left the district. If you ask her why, she'll say, why should I? Now she spends her days volunteering with Tom at the Potter's House, and it was at the Potter's House where some of the most significant legislation relating to civil rights was drafted. Legislation which informed the lives and the work of people like Maudine Cooper of the Greater Washington Urban League. See, she spent her life working on issues of equality and civil rights in the city, first for the Greater Washington Urban League, and before that, for Mayor Barry, or some might call him the mayor for life, people like Duke, who we'll get to in a second. Duke used to run a little shop over on U Street. When he came into some trouble, it was Marion Barry who helped him. Marion Barry who helped him open his shoe shop over on 14th and W Street, right across from Bus Boys and Poets. And now, at the age of 90, he continues to shine shoes. Shoes was where Chuck Brown, the godfather of Go Go, got his start. Before, in between shoes and music, he spent some time over at Lorton, a federal penitentiary over in Virginia, which is now closed. It was there where he traded cigarettes for a guitar to start Go Go music. Unfortunately, Lorton had already been closed by the time Jermaine, at the age of 16, was locked up. And because DC lacks a federal penitentiary, he had to spend his time incarcerated in North Dakota. But he's still hopeful, and he's hopeful because of his child, similar to Scott and Cynthia, who think about the future of DC in terms of Sabine. And like so many people, they think about this challenge. How do we stay in a city we love when there are not educational opportunities? Do you move to the suburbs, or do you do something like Jessica did, which was open her own school, Two Rivers Charter School over on Florida Avenue, a school that was inspired by Outward Bound? And it's there partly because of the philosophy and partly because of people like Jim Curtis, a developer that the numbers of the school are growing so much. See, Jim inherited a piece of land in the 90s that was valueless to him. And it's now Noma, one of the fastest growing neighborhoods. See, what he saw was there was opportunity in the land and the opportunity was around transportation. And that transportation was also the same opportunity that gave Cedric a livelihood for his family. You may know Cedric as the exercise guy, the guy who spins in circles running through intersections around downtown. He starts, his house, he starts at his house on 8th Street and ends up in front of Treasury, where Dan Tangerlini works. Dan is one of these incredible people, one of those guys who's gone back and forth between local and federal government, always with an eye on what's best for the city and the nation, now he works as an assistant secretary at Treasury, working on behalf of payroll, paying people like Barry. An IT consultant by day, a Ben Franklin impersonator by night. <laughs> See, what he sees is that there's a value in him looking like Ben Franklin as an ability to teach kids like Jay about history. Because Jay can tell you everything about DC history, but his real love is about basketball. And if you ask Jay about the best street ball in DC, he'll send you to Barry Farms where the best street ball in DC takes place. And Sarita knows that because that's where she got her start before she got a scholarship to go play ball at Georgetown. After that, a career in basketball, she went on to do customer service, where she worked at the Connecticut Avenue Hilton. The Hilton, many of you also know, is the Hinkley Hilton. And it's Mike and Ann Putzel who are the ones who broke the story of Reagan's assassination because Mike was there. And so as a result, that hotel will always be so significant to these people for their career and also for what it means. Hotels and dungeons are also significant to Mistress Demina, a local dominatrix, but don't be confused, she's not a prostitute. She's a dominatrix, which she engages in is power exchange. That exchange of working in the city where there's so many power brokers, and she works with them for an hour to take that away. Somebody who's also familiar with power brokers' crotches is Georges de Paris, <laughs> who's been the tailor to every single president since Lyndon Johnson. And if you go into his shop, you'll see bespoke clothing for every single important person here. What's interesting is that his career started being homeless, similar to Carl here. But see, Carl's story doesn't end up so rosy. Carl, of the 500 people that I've interviewed for People's District, can speak most articulately about the impact of DC's lack of statehood, something that Alir has spent his entire career working on. See, he's out there working for our representation. But rather than leave this on a policy note, because this is a tour of DC, I want to leave you with Alicia here. 
who will come up in a second. Lisa's five years old, and I asked her about all the challenges that we're facing DC, from natural disasters to lack of voting. And her response was, don't worry, because if any challenges comes to DC, I'm going to punch them in the face. <laughs> okay? So let me leave you with this, this inspiration. I obviously don't want to condone violence. But it's partly that that encourages me to encourage all of you to say that all of us have the opportunity to make this a more integrated city and to make this a city that fully recognizes its potential. Thank you.